A father must labor daily to make his home, regardless of the size, a happy home. Men, the father is the leader of the home. In fact, I don't buy the, as the mother goes, so goes the home. I don't think that's biblical. All the way from Bokota village in Limpopo, South Africa, we bring you Missionary Minds, where you can learn about family, church history, biblical worldview issues, and of course, missions. All from the mind of a real world missionary of almost 20 years. And Buddy Paul, today we have the question, where should parents of big families find encouragement? Over to you, Mfundisi. First, the story. Anthony Norris Groves, his wife and children survived innumerable tragedies while living as missionaries in Baghdad, Iraq in the 1800s, including a terrible plague that killed tens of thousands and a flood that destroyed many homes and killed thousands more. And they endured the hatred of the locals as they were serving as missionaries. And you might think that his children perhaps became embittered at their parents, or maybe they would despise the God their parents came to serve. But the opposite is true. The two children that endured these tragedies in Baghdad actually had a very strong walk with the Lord, and the two children that came after the terrible trials in Baghdad actually did not enjoy such a close walk with the Lord. Why is this? Robert Dan who is the author of the biography of Anthony Norris Groves, writes this. As we look back at the lives of the brothers, we might wonder how it was that Henry and Frank, who suffered all the physical horrors of Baghdad, grew up so sane, balanced, and we might almost say conventional. While Edward, who had a commonplace private school upbringing, like any other Victorian boy with parents overseas, should turn out so strangely. The reason may lie in the fact that Henry and Frank faced the horrors of Baghdad with their father and mother, secure in their parents' love and affection, while Edward, feeling uncared for and abandoned, suffered the horrors of Tusculum on his own. Experience shows that a child needs the love of his parents or substitute parents more than anything else. Assured of it, He could face almost any adversity. Deprived of it, he may be left with scars that never heal. I love that quote from Dan because it shows the importance that parents play, not just in a family, but in a large family and even surrounding many acts of suffering. As I thought about that story, I could almost hear the groans of our modern-day elites crying, Why have children? Why force them to endure such terrible events? And if you are to have children, why have so many? Four, six, eight, ten, twelve? Is it also necessary? I had a friend recently ask me where my wife and I have received the encouragement and fortitude while raising so many children. This man had himself grown up in a large family and was used to strangers kind of looking at the family oddly. So where does a family get encouragement with having so many kids and all the challenges that come with it? Well, we're going to try to answer that question today in a few ways. Thank you for the introduction, brother. I can totally understand such odd looks. Big families are considered freaks in our day and age, and those who desire big families are thought to be antiquated and backward. Where do you source your encouragement? Well, the first way I would answer this is that it's so important that the husband and wife are on the same page on this matter of having children, however many children you have. And you might think that the husband and wife seen eye to eye on the matter of having many children would be common, but sadly, it's not. In small families, often one spouse wanted more, 
And in large families, one spouse may have wanted less. And so there's some disagreement there. So I would say a lot of the encouragement that I get with my wife comes actually from my wife because we are in lockstep on this matter. We're not giving each other evil eyes when one of the children may act up or when there's unexpected bills to pay on behalf of the children. And I would say part of this has come through the uh, husband's responsibility of shepherding the soul of his wife and communicating to her consistently through word and through deed that children are a blessing. Hit that note again and again. Children are a blessing. It makes me think of the story in Genesis 33 when Esau comes to his brother Jacob. He lifts up his eyes and he sees all of these uh, children around him. And he said, who are these with you? And Jacob said, the children whom God has graciously given your servant. That's the right kind of attitude. Okay, next, please explain what exactly is a big family? How do we define that? Because many would consider that a relative term. Yes, defining a family, Carney, would actually lead to another source of the encouragement that we get from having a big family, and that would be Scripture. I mean, define big family. What exactly is a big family? I would say we really don't have a large family at all unless you compare it to a very small slice of world history, perhaps 2023 America. But if you compared us to the genealogies in First Chronicles, for example, of people that had far less conveniences than we do, we actually have a somewhat small family. It reminds me of a guy that came up to me after I spoke at Grace Community Church recently. Uh, er, earlier, they had made an announcement as I was speaking. I was doing a question and answer time. And they had made an announcement that I was a father of eight children. And there was kind of this, ooh, that went through the crowd of the young college and career room to hear eight children. But then afterwards, when this young man approached me, I think he was one of 14 children, I, I could see the way he was looking at me, and he was looking at me unimpressed, as if to say, why do you have such a small family? And I think, yeah, a big family is relative. The, the more I read the Bible, the more I'm convinced that our family is on the right track. The more we're convinced that though it's hard, and though there are challenges, we're never going to regret this. It makes me think of Vody Bauckham's illustration. Uh, I think it was in his book, Family Driven Faith. And he tells a story about how his wife uh, tied the tubes after two children, and then he started growing and learning and reading, and they tried to have a surgery to reverse it, and they couldn't. And that story of pain and regret, I don't ever want to experience. Just hearing how he had to apologize to his wife and ask forgiveness and not thinking the correct way. And of course, the Lord can forgive, but I don't want to experience that. And I think that's in part why grandparents are so over the moon with their grandkids. How, no matter how they might be gruff and strict with their own children, how compassionate and kind and joyful and proud of their grandchildren. How how do we explain this? Well, one way we could explain is this. They're wiser. And now they can see more clearly in the past what a blessing children are. And many times they wish that they'd had more, but now it's too late. So have kids see the glories of having children. And much of that encouragement comes from Scripture. You know, Aflate have wondered if grandparents are the way they are about children because at the end of their lives, They've realized what really matters the most in life. Thank you for helping develop that pattern of thought. Are there any big family men that you look up to? Uh, There's many people that I look up to for encouragement. I would say seeing other Christians with big families would be a source of encouragement. Uh, As I've traveled throughout the United States, especially on furlough or being in different churches, and when you see those children 
in the crowd, when you see big families, it gives you hope. It gives you encouragement. It gives you hope that there will be spouses for your own children uh, one day. It just saddens me so much when I go to churches and every once in a while, just before you get up to preach, they dismiss the kids to children's church. And I understand you might send the infants out, but I've seen churches that sometimes will send them out all the way up to 12 years old or something. Oh, but when you see the children together, sitting together with the families, that's that's so uplifting to me and edifying. I would say many of the authors and Christians that I respect most have had large families. Uh, missionaries, I would say, are known for having large families, and this shouldn't be surprising because missionaries are also known for often being the most dedicated Christians. I think it was J.S. Bach that had 20 children, and his home was known for being among the happiest in the town. Uh, William Gouge, the Puritan, has written much on the family. Many of the Puritans uh, make me want to have even more kids because they had so many children themselves, and they were such redwoods in the field of theology. They thought so carefully about the Lord Jesus Christ. Susanna Wesley was uh, a wife of a pastor, mother of 19 children, including the great Charles and John Wesley. I recently listened to the journals of John Wesley. Actually, my wife was listening to it first. I didn't listen to it all the way through, but I listened to portions of the journals of John Wesley. And there's a section in there of where she lays out her rules for raising children. Outstanding. Now, those rules alone would be worth the price of the book. You know, brother... In most cases, I think being on a list together with those renowned names you mentioned would mean that you've found yourself in good company. But in our day, needless to say, there are fear mongers and naysayers. As we mentioned earlier, people with big families are considered freaks. Who would you say are the big enemies of big families? Yes, Carney, I would say many in our world today and in the past would be enemies of big families. But I would say the more they criticize, actually, the more I'm actually encouraged and want to continue on having children and raising my children in a Christ-centered way. Uh, For example, let me just give one prominent enemy of families. Uh, One would be the anti-family site called stophavingkids.org. I'm not kidding. This is actually the name of a website. It's called stophavingkids.org. And when you read that site, I'm actually more encouraged. It is a site of despair and hopelessness. Uh, Here you have older ladies giving testimonies of how they're so glad that they didn't have children or uh, bragging about the abortions that they may have had. Feminists and pagans that promote this kind of godlessness, such as annihilating the fruit of the womb. This doesn't pull me to their side. We look at them and say, we need to raise up a horde of Christ followers, troublemakers, for Jesus' sake, let us have more children. So, just as I would say the doctrines of grace, People have asked me, what has brought me to Calvinism or to to the doctrines of grace? And I'd have a long list of those. Scripture would, of course, be one of them. I would actually say the arguments from the other side have actually been one of the greatest tools to bring me to the doctrines of the grace. And I would actually say the arguments from the other side of fruitless wombs and no families and no children actually pushes me even more to wanting to have a big family. I'm delighted at your stubborn determination to use the naysayers' opinions as wind under your wings to continue. Can you point us to any authors in this regard? Uh, Yes, there are several modern authors that convey the greatness of having children, convey love for children, uh, many of them in the past, but also in the present, uh, in the past. They were easier, perhaps, to find because they so often had big families. Uh, I would think even someone like Charles Spurgeon, who I think just had his twin boys, uh, his wife was not able to have more children. 
But he, even he wrote a great book on children called Come Ye Children. It's one of the books that we have our teachers read at our school in the village at Misebe, and it's just promoting the wonders of children, how children can believe, how children are a blessing, how children can be used as great tools in God's kingdom, how they can be used in the church. Uh, today, just a few that I really appreciate, someone like Anthony Esselin has written some excellent books on children, Doug Wilson, of course, uh, Michael Foster, and others uh, have done an excellent job of giving uh, the church a lot of great resources on the wonders of children. Thank you for that helpful list, brother. Could you leave us with some parting words for our journey ahead to honor the Lord with trying to fulfill the creation mandate and however many children he would bless us with? Yes, parting words, Carney. I would say a father must labor daily to make his home, regardless of the size, a happy home. Men. The father is the leader of the home. In fact, I don't buy the, as the mother goes, so goes the home. I don't think that's biblical. And I'm not vague with my children as to the glories of having lots of kids one day. And I know there's a good chance that several of my children may not be capable of having children. And praise the Lord. You serve him however he blesses you. But if they are able to have children, there is no greater joy. Uh, But I can't merely say this. I need to show it by making the home warm and making the home full of bliss. Yes, as the leader, I need to be a disciplinarian. I need to give the home vision. Uh, I need to discipline and point them in the right direction. But the father sets the tone. Uh, We're told in 1 Timothy 3 that actually he's the manager of the home. He manages the home. So I want to make my sons and daughters, in a sense, if I can say this in a holy way, jealous to one day have what we have. Contrary to many homes where the children only look back with bitterness at the home, at their home that was full of chaos that they grew up in. Sometimes this happens in small homes, but sadly, many times I meet people from big homes. And they look back with disdain. I couldn't wait to get out of that home. I, I never wanted to mimic my parents of having a big family because it was, it was terrible. You know, I, I heard a quote recently from um, RFK Jr., Robert Kennedy Jr., of all people. I, I, he has many children, I think maybe seven or something like that. And he recently said he doesn't care what other people think about him because he said, I've got seven kids, and they all love me. Why would I care what other people think? And I think that's it. I feel the same way. I have a wife. I have eight children. They they think I'm the greatest in the world. Why would I care what the world thinks about me? Now, this is not a diatribe to promote having as many children as you possibly can. I understand that there are many factors at play And some of them may be good reasons to limit children. Now, I think those reasons are probably far less than we may think, but I I would recognize that. But when it comes to the number, I heard a pastor uh, give some good advice recently. He said, have more than you think you can handle. And so with that in mind, when talking about the encouragements uh, to a family of lots of children, those would be just some pointers of what has helped my wife and I continue on loving our children and thanking God for the glories of having a big family. What a treat, Mfundisi. To our audience, if you've enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to rate it and subscribe to keep posted with more upcoming content. Feel free to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting and submit any questions you may want answered in a future podcast. You can email those questions to paulschleyline at gmail.com You can also visit betweentwocultures.com for other resources like this. I'm your host Yamikani Katunga and until next time that's it from Missionary Minds.